Well, no, I feel that we need to have some esteemed guest who has never been on Twitter Spaces who has nothing but this to, <laughs> to get the, the full yeah. on uh, um, the full on. Yeah, no, I, I did want to start with uh, it's not a mispronunciation, but I did think um, uh, you know the drinking game for sh- tonight should be if uh, someone used their people are welcome to use the word performant but they will need to define it after they use it. So that that's the threat. <laughs> You're welcome to use the word performant. It's just Adam's going to make you wear this performant hat on your head <laughs> that says in large letters, I think performant is a word. Right. No, and and this like, is what I think it means. And, right. Right. I, so you also, I mean, I do not use performant, obviously. I know. I know. I, I mean, I mean, I don't know if that's obvious, but I'm relieved. Uh, I don't use performant. I try not to use. Perf- I don't use performant except when I'm like accidentally mocking someone. Um, and d- and because... do we, we feel the same way about learnings, right? Well, uh, so let's see. I also don't use the word learnings. Um, I think we maybe feel differently, but I, I try to only use the word utilize very narrowly, like when I'm talking about utilization, like as a fraction of the whole. Uh, but performant in particular, I just feel like people sprinkle around to mean nothing in particular, just sort of goodness uh, abstractly. Whereas learnings is is a different personality defect to refer to things that you know have a much less horrible name. I think learnings sounds ridiculous, and I think it. I'm sorry, and I, I with no offense intended to the. I honor those who use it, I guess, but I think it sounds. Do you? No, I don't. <laughs> I, 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 I think it sounds ridiculous, and I think it is especially ironic that you are speaking to the quality of being educated using a word that sounds so made up. Is what that I and I accept that. Well, do I accept that language is evolving? I am instructed that I have to accept that language is evolving. <laughs> by by whom? Because the person who instructed me of this was you. I instructed you the language is evolving only to make my own point about something. And that was, that, <laughs> I, I was only trotting that one out for my own very narrow self-interest. There is no way. I, th- I mean, and I, 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 this I have inherited from my mother. If anyone knows how that language should be evolving only at the time that is advantageous to themselves, I learned that from my mother. That's. Yeah, th- that's fine. I mean, it makes sense. That, that tracks. Right. At, at all other times, language is actually not, in fact, evolving. So right, no. So we're going to try to avoid the word performant, or people are going to have there. Sure. Uh, uh, okay. Can we? Uh, we'll let's just get through all these and then be done with it. We can go on to async and everything else. Uh, leverage, on the other hand, I know people get very upset about leverage as a verb. That one doesn't bother me. It. Uh, I think leverage, like utilize, to me, are just there are simpler, more precise stand-ins. Uh, so I think it just says more about the speaker. All right, then. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 Um, all right. So, so and, and I'm sure that we've got other, other classes of these as well, but we want to get on to the, the main event. Yeah, that's right. Which is, uh, so your tweet, um, this is, you are basically, uh, and actually you know, it reminds me of, you know, Feynman had a line that when I cannot explain something to my freshman physics X class, this kind of famous ex- a class of accelerated physics class at Caltech of very bright 18 year olds and Feynman, I'm sure I'm, I'm, I'm mutilating the quote, but Feynman ha- conveyed that when I can't explain something to that class, it's because we don't completely understand it. I think he was using that in, in, Relation to, to uh, quantum electrodynamics, if I recall correctly, but the which I thought was always an interesting way of of kind of the, the metric for our own understanding of something is how well we can explain it to someone who is bright but new. Did, had, yeah, it, that is that is awesome, and actually dovetails from last week where we were talking a bit about kind of designing products, and we're in a phase now at Oxide where uh, I think we're less or I'm feeling less in design documents and more like, how do we explain it to our users? Yeah. Yeah, Right. And, and writing documentation for the, you know, varyingly educated user is always humbling because if you realize that it's hard, it's hard to explain a thing. Uh, Totally. Well, maybe, maybe you built the wrong thing. Well, and I, and you and I both believe this and definitely this is a deeply held oxide value that 
uh, that engineers should be documenting their own ideas because in that documentation of your own ideas, you learn how the ideas themselves have flaws. Flaws that won't, yeah. that won't necessarily be seen by other people, by the way. Um, the, the, the subtle flaws. And we kind of got here because you're try- you got a, 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 your precocious son <laughs> who is a model for all children, I, who, aside from his natural experimentation with C++, um, and you're trying to explain async to him. Is that yes. right? I mean, that, yeah, is that a fair? Yes. And, I should, I, and I should back up for a second because we refer to my, my son, my son's actually variously on this program. Wait, the, you, your five-year-old is not, you're not expecting No, that's what I mean. That's what I, I just want to emphasize. The one we talk about for the reason I need to leave in a hurry is the five-year-old, not the 16-year-old who is, and these are two different, very, very different humans. Very different. But which, which that do have one unifying characteristic, which is when I say something like, based on my years of experience, the thing that you're about to do is going to end in disaster. They both have the exact same reaction, which is, more or less to tell me to get fucked. Yeah, yeah, get, get but, back. Uh, yeah, totally. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, 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 there's, a, there's a lot unifying. That, it's a unified front in that regard. But yeah, so uh, well, older boy uh, learning C++, um, mostly by himself, despite my many offers to help, which is fine. <laughs> it's good. Right? And that's uh, age appropriate. Uh, age appropriate. That's good. Exactly. I'm not delighted. But there are, there are these rare delightful moments where he comes and asks me a particular thing. Or, you know, I walked into his room and the book that I discovered that he had bought with, without my knowledge was one on systems programming. You can, I mean, talk about being a proud, fa- proud father on that one. Absolutely. I, the, these are feelings that I actually I don't know anything about these feelings. <laughs> because <laughs> it is now the time to talk about what I, my parenting experience was over the weekend. I feel like we can't get through this without. <laughs> oh, I, I don't know. I mean, absolutely. Okay. My, so we're, I, I, and I, I, I I actually I didn't tell him and he didn't make me promise that I wouldn't put photos on the internet, but for I'm not gonna put photos on the internet of my 15 year old who decided that he wanted to get a buzz cut from a friend uh, over the weekend. It's like a dumbass 15 year old decision in exchange for an Oculus. So a, a friend offered it, this makes no sense. And it's like, this is who you are. You're a human guinea pig. Like you have some self-respect, but he was not terribly interested by opinion. Did your son join the Marine Corps uh, or something? Pretty much. So he, his friend is giving him a buzz cut, and the clippers break halfway through this haircut, giving, leaving him with truly, and Adam, you've seen the photos, truly the worst haircut I've ever seen in my life. I mean, it does look like an industrial accident. More than and, to, to which my counter is an industrial accident would have more symmetry than this haircut. That, 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 <laughs> that a, a machine that has whirling blades, uh, it, it, whatever tragedy that this thing would, would do to you, it would actually have more symmetry than this haircut, which looks like it is a deliberately bad haircut. It's just amazingly bad. So, so while you are like trying to, d- to explain the subtleties of asynchronous systems to, to your son discovering, you know, walking him through the beauty of systems design, I am literally like trying to help my... 15 year old figure out how he's going to like because he's like i'm just going to have this cleaned up professionally i'm like walk me through that are you going to wear a towel on your head when you go into a professional establishment because when you take that towel off your head everybody is going to stop and laugh very hard at your anyway so there we go that i i that, that's that's off my chest yeah so so my summer uh a bit, um, but but you know, Will came to me and, and was asking about threads and or uh, because the C plus plus book had, had come to threads and, and Brandon often mentioned this to you as well. But he we actually were in Providence as well, so I was able to introduce him to our systems professor that's Tom so Dabner, great. Oh, that's so nice. Um, who, who actually I, I'm I'm going to bring up again later later in this space mm. um, from one of your collaborations, Brian, with him years and years ago. But um, so you know, real interest in systems asking about threading. And I was talking about blocking IO and, and threading. And, and then uh, one of the things I've been doing a lot of in Rust at Oxide is async programming. So started trying to explain that again to someone who has, you know, dozens of lines of code to their name, right? Like not hundreds <laughs> right. of lines of code, right. like dozens of, so there's not a lot to hold yeah. on to. Um, and I realized that my, you know, it was, it was tricky to explain. So, I started looking through a systems book and a C++ book and a bunch of other places. And everything was sort of like, well, a task is like a thread, but it's different than a thread. And there are these things called futures. And of course, to practitioners, you know, we get into it, it, it makes sense eventually. 
Uh, but I found it really unsatisfying. To explain threading or to explain asynchronous? Pardon me, to explain yeah, asynchronous. Yeah, yeah. I think threading, threading, I think, is, is actually much more intuitive. It's much easier to explain. That, I, that, that, at least my experience, you know, explaining it to him and seeing his understanding of it makes sense, right? I think there are analogies that, that seem very straightforward that, uh, that he was... It, cooks in the kitchen is my go-to on that one. The kitchen, as these things do, but... Um, but yeah, but then, you know, async and the distinction between it, some of the definition of these terms just was squirrelier. It is. Yeah. I mean, it's hard. And also, it's like you've got in any system, you have synchronous elements in any system and asynchronous elements in any system. And you're not going to have a system that is purely asynchronous. And you're not going to have a system. Well, I think you're less likely to have a system that is pure. Like you do have systems, I guess, that are purely synchronous. But it, 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 not every single operation in a system, I don't think, is going to be asynchronous. You're, you're going to reserve these for your relatively longer operations. And how do you kind of keep track of the state that you've got while you're waiting for this thing, this longer latency thing to happen with for some value of latency? Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, the, you know, there are a bunch of places I want to go here, but one of them, Brian, and you can take it now or later, is Threadmon. So, um, you know, in, I think, pre-Solaris 9, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, there was a two-level scheduling model. That is to say, there were kernel threads and there were user threads multiplexed on top of each other. And, and I know that async await is not exactly that, but I think there's a bunch of stuff in common. Yeah, and I think, and a bunch of that, that the, those kind of, the multi-level threading, I think, is a historical accident, first and foremost. I think that like a lot of that actually comes from people having operating systems. We're talking in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, that are that, that, in which multiple threads are not supported. Multiple processes are supported, but multiple threads are not supported. And if you have an operating system that only supports a single thread of control... And, you know, you're a wily programmer that is aware of John von Neumann's gift. You can implement what are threads on top of that single kernel level entity. And I think that's where a lot of this is born, honestly. As I was as you kind of like, because you, you have to unpack the arguments for having these different levels of control. And what we had <laughs> by the time I walked up to it in the mid 90s was this very ornate monstrosity of wh where you have many kernel level schedulable entities, which and in Solaris parlance was, were called lightweight processes, LWPs. And then you had some other number of user level threads. And this is the M to N nature of that comes from you have M threads and N LWPs. And like, why would you do it this way? <laughs> and I and the arguments were I and I remember as an undergraduate just finding like these these arguments are not really like I don't get them actually is what I remember thinking. I'm like I don't understand them because the arguments for that which I, and I mean it kind of there's a big difference between the the M to N thread scheduling model and these kind of pure async systems and async await and so on. So I don't want to color them all with the same brush, but the arguments around the multi-level threading were or that it, it would make synchronization primitives would be much lighter um, and that it would be faster. And I'm like, not always. And then there were also the, these ideas that you could create millions of threads. Well, I'm like, all right, well, I'm going to go create a million threads. And of course you cannot create anywhere close to a billion threads. In fact, the whole system would, the whole system, kernel included, would grind to a halt when you created like on the order of low thousands of threads. And it was very clear that like you kind of take all these arguments, like the, the arguments just were not supported. They were not evidence-based arguments. They were not data-based arguments. They were kind of, it was, it was Conway's law. It was a lot of things going on. Um, so yeah, that was my, you know, an early intro to some level of, of asynchrony. Um, but that is not, you know, I'm, I'm not sure how much of that carries over, how much of the, so I'm, yeah. Well, well, you know, one of the things that it got me thinking, well, first I started this, you know, uh, kind of thought experiment of like, how would I divine, uh, create an operating system that was optimized around async await? Like, what would that look like? 
And I started thinking like, is that that different from threads or from these two level models? Um, and, you know, the, I also got to thinking back to the two level scheduling model, there were these problems, right? That came up from multiple schedulers unaware of each other or only tenuously aware of each other where, you know, one would be trying to assert affinity that the other was breaking. So for example, in, in those, you know, Solaris battle days, you'd have the kernel working really hard to keep the schedulable entity it knew about the ULWP on a particular, uh, on a particular socket back in those days. And the user level scheduler might be swapping yes. around these different contexts. Yeah. So like the, the, you know, any locality or affinity was, was lost. Absolutely. And we saw that. And the, you also had this problem of, and, and actually in the battle days of Solaris, it was an even more pernicious problem. They, there was a single scheduler lock that would, was held at user level. And that lock, because it, it didn't have global system visibility and it could pull some of the tricks of the kernel, you had some certain operations that simply were never going to scale at user level. Um, because it was really hard to implement the system with that kind of limited visibility. And then you're operating, it's just as you say, at cross purposes with the system beneath you. So do you think that that is a more general theme, though? Uh, I mean, it, it, like, I just haven't seen that addressed, right? I think that, um, it, 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 and I think the, the, the bigger question or the, that I kept on running into is, I, I don't think anyone's saying that async await is always better than threads, or that threads are always better than async await. I don't think people are making that argument. Um, although I guess in JavaScript, you don't have a lot of options. Um, like you don't have multiple yes. threads. Yeah. Um, so then, you know, fo like I, I haven't seen folks talking about this, the, you know, when one approach is more appropriate or how to examine a problem to infer whether async await or, or threads is going to be like a better solution or, or, or more, more likely. Um, and then I also haven't seen, you know, critiques of async await that say, you know, you're going to, you're losing some of these attributes, right? You're the, the kernel is going to be, would normally work hard to give you this locality and you're losing that. And for the kind, and so if your problem looks at regular shape, you might not want to do that. Yeah. It, it, what do you think about comprehensibility too? I mean, it, and this is where, Oh my gosh. <laughs> yes. I mean, this is a place where async, I mean, now I'm talking a little bit more about rust async. Yeah. But one of the, one of the great things about threads is I can walk up to a process and I can say, what are all the threads that you have and where are they? Yeah. And, and this also got me thinking about the definition of a thread versus a task. But one of the neat things about a thread is that it's only at one place at one time. Yes. And, and, and that's sort of, that may seem obvious, oh, but it, it, this is know, really, it really important. important. No, it would, yeah. and Cliff's got a great line about this, about it, the, the program counter is a very important piece of state. And th th that's exactly it. You can only be in one spot at one time. And so all of your threads of control uh, can only be in one spot at one time. And we use that all the time in, an, in operating system implementation. Because, uh, you know, it, it, like we implement asynchrony in hubris by having a series of asynchronous, but actually in fact, purely synchronous tasks. And to say each task itself is purely synchronous. We don't have multiple threads of control in that memory protected region, but you can have that the, the tasks are asynchronous with respect to one another. It, it may be interesting to note that this is true in almost every operating system, right? I mean, Unix has been multi-threaded since Unix fourth edition. And what I mean by that is that once every process, even in ancient versions of Unix that didn't support user space visible threading, every process was backed by a thread of control in the kernel. Right. And so when you would wrap into the kernel, you were automatically running in this multi-threaded context. I, it, I mean, much of this discussion comes from the fact that the Unix design specifically was meant to isolate asynchrony. Um, yeah, Doug exactly. McElroy said this explicitly. You know, I.O. was not asynchronous, as it was in many other contemporary operating systems at the time. So Adam said, hey, what would an operating system look like if it was designed for basically async A wait? The answer is basically VAX VMS and then Windows NT. Because hmm. VAX VMS specifically had queued I.O. as a sort of native primitive. And then they had this notion of an asynchronous software trap. So you would queue an I.O. When the I.O. was completed, your process would get a trap. And effectively, everything was like you're writing async await code. Yeah, and and I/O completion ports are kind of like the thing that that VMS slash NT does like pretty well. Actually, they've got a good right. a, good abstractions to that. Yeah, yeah, it's a good point. 
Uh, and it, they had a very good point about the history of Unix. And I feel that like, Every Unix goes through this. Certainly, uh, this happened for, I can say, for this happened at Unix for sure. Um, and I, this obviously happened at Linux, where in Linux, where someone says, like, hey, wait a minute. So I've been told that I need to implement threads. But what are threads if they aren't just processes that share memory? And you want to be like, ooh, I don't know about this. Uh. <laughs> and you end up with this kind of threading implementation where actually, they, they are actually processes that are just now going to share memory, kind of an R fork, the, the IREX's old R fork. I guess that's a plan nineism too. Plan nine. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that ends up having its own baggage associated with it. I mean, I think it's like the thing that, that Unix was to a certain degree denying that I think, Adam, you're kind of like the, part of the, 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 the part of the quest is that we do have to acknowledge that user level processes have a right to their own internal parallelism, their internal concurrency. And, and, you know, the traditional Unix model really didn't allow that at all. Like that concurrency is all external. Exactly. Actually, that is fundamentally one of the big reasons that this always breaks down in the Unix model. You have these end to end threading models, but then you have a user space thread which, oh golly, executes a blocking system call. Well, okay, now one tenth yeah. <laughs> of your parallelism has yeah. basically gone away. Yeah, right? right, right, totally, totally. And then we get to, so do you know how, oh God, this is so gross. This is also disgusting. I wish I could purge this from my memory and retain more important facts about life. But do you know how Solaris dealt with this? So you would, like, how do you deal with this? Like you are, you, because just as you say, Dan, you've got a blocking system call, takes that LWP out effectively. So now this user level thread, and in this kind of Fantasia, I have millions of user level threads. And one of, the, one of these hordes has taken this valuable LWP and is now blocked in the kernel. And now, you know, we only have, now we have kind of uh, an N minus one of these things. Do you know how Slayers would deal with the last one? <laughs> I kind of <laughs> guess that it sends a POSIX signal to the thread that was ding, 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 wow. We have a winner or we're all losers, depending on how you want to interpret that. But yes, exactly. I, I, you know, like, again, I think you go back to the deficiencies in the Unix design. And at the time, these were not considered deficiencies. I don't mean to paint them in a, in a light that is inappropriate. But they purposely made it so that you, you know, they purposely decided we will not expose asynchronous IO operations yeah, or anything. Right. You know, you're you're going to block, you're going to block, period, end of story. And they just didn't expose any sort of mechanism that you could do anything other than basically send a signal to the thread. Right. And so that's what I mean. In, in Swearers, it was SIG waiting. Um, and actually, Adam, I don't know if you just said that Threadmon actually had the ability to drop a SIG waiting on the target process, which is like totally violating the prime directive of a debugger. Um, and it would actually like generate LWPs. <laughs> It's <laughs> uh, pretty silly. Well, because, yeah. because I mean, there was also I mean, the problem with over overloading that mechanism is there was nothing to prevent you from dropping a SIG waiting signal on a process. It's like yeah, here, have this message from the kernel that says you should go create a port LWP. It's like, oh, okay, what's going on? Okay, I guess I, I, I guess guess make an LWP. Like, <laughs> nothing to do, but here right. I have it. Yeah, I right. Mean, there, there is a place where this mechanism lives on today and i i actually can you guess what it is uh oh no where the go runtime oh uh, this is where it's okay exactly yeah. the go runtime does. if you execute a system call that shunts it over onto a special thread they have yeah. people, people run some threads to do system calls but you know like there's some system calls you don't know whether it's going to block or not yeah right and what they do is they set a timer, and if that timer expires, then you send a signal to the thread. <laughs> oh, <Jesus laughs> Christ, man. And, and, and then, you know, <laughs> even Rust Async has, like, similar pathologies, right? Like, it, it does a pretty good job, or a good job, of making sure that it's calling non-blocking I.O. But if you call some blocking thing, then, again, one nth of your thread pool is dedicated to waiting. Well, I mean, again, I go back to some deficiencies in the Unix system interface. Like, you really, truly do not know when things are going to block. I mean, so, for example, the open system call takes as argument basically three arguments, right? But there's a path name, which is a string, which you specify as a pointer, takes a mode, and then potentially takes, like, uh, permission flags or something like that if you're creating a new file. However, 
it is always synchronous with respect to resolving the file name into a file descriptor. And so if the file name argument exists in memory that's been paged out, because it was part of the read-only text segment or, or read-only data segment or something like that, or if the kernel has to walk through the directory components and those aren't in the directory cache, then you're potentially blocking many, many times. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, right. If, if, if that's some, some read-only data that's paged out and you have to fetch exactly. it over NFS or whatever, yeah, like that's a long yeah. way away. Yeah. yeah, I mean, so, you know, just the things that we don't necessarily think of being blocking are really blocky these days. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's kind of like a very, I mean, it's basically the halting problem, right? The blocking problem basically is the halting problem at some level. I mean, it's very, I mean, obviously they're not the same, but the, the, it's very hard to reason, especially in across the system call boundary, where you really don't have any idea um, it, how, and, and then also a very subtle change in implementation can completely change behavior. And I think that this is kind of get, gets to something that I am not in love with about async systems. And Adam, love to know your take on this. The, the one of the challenges of async systems is they they work well until they don't. And when they don't, you get this nonlinearity of response time where all of a sudden you hit queuing delays and response time just explodes. And it can be very hard because the queues in an all async system are often hidden, that they're, they're architecturally hidden. It can be really hard to reason about why the hell are we not making forward progress? Who is responsible for forward progress right now and where the hell are you? Is, yeah. is something that I find really can be frustrating in an, in an async system. No, absolutely. And I, I think that debugging these systems, uh, both in the, those kinds of specific cases, but also generally, is hard. And, um, you know, this is speaking for now Rust, which is where I've been spending most of my time. I'm a little disappointed by the amount of effort put into making these systems debug debuggable before shipping them. Um, and also even making them comprehensible. I'll tell you a, a, a point of confusion that I ran into, which was when we were building the D-Trace, um, like uh, the USDT interface for Rust. So Ben Nacker and I were working on this. And one of the things that is very common in D-Trace is to key data based on the current thread. But yeah. most of the stuff we were looking at was async. So like the thread didn't really matter. If you use the, yeah. the current thread, you would, it, it, it's as, almost as good as random, right? Like, cause the current thread will switch next time you're on the CPU. So um, I spent a bunch of time uh, trying to um, negotiate with Tokyo, not like the community, just the source code to try <laughs> to infer like a task ID. Cause surely I thought there must be this task ID but now I've realized that even if there were a task ID that was readily accessible and, and they are you know, reasonably or, or they take the reasonable position of not making that accessible. But even if it were accessible, it would still be wrong because a future can effectively be in multiple places at the same time. So using, using the task ID would be sort of meaningless in a way that having a, a thread ID is very meaningful. Right, because you've got no way, and then you all because you also are that there's another really key bit that now no longer makes sense, and that's the stack backtrace. I mean, it is actually really nice. A stack backtrace is great. Glory be to the stack backtrace that tells you a lot of contextual information from an understandability perspective of like where am I and how did I get here, and that I think is one of the big challenges. By the way, I think it's. I mean, I definitely agree with you that there's uh, that there's a lot more to be done for the debuggability of async await in Rust. But oh my God, if you, I mean, this in Node with futures, futures were completely undebuggable, and you would have a, 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 a in particular, you could have a, uh, a something that's executed in the future that actually hits like a typo, like it, the, it, this object doesn't exist undefined. You have an exception. It is absolute bedlam, and trying to figure, trying to correlate that back to what actually induced it. This is ultimately what induced the crack up between Joyent and Node.js. Like this is the reason we got divorced is over that exact issue. I mean, of course, as with many divorces, it's like that was the <laughs> it's complicated. <laughs> it's, complicated. <laughs> it's complicated, right? It's like it's like it's not actually just about this act of infidelity. It's about infidelity more broadly and what that represents, and you know, um, <laughs> yeah. But so I, I remember uh, I, I remember that you guys went your own path and, and were sticking with 
uh, with callbacks. Um, but th- presumably those have some of the same attributes, right? It, it, I mean, sure, futures oh, yeah, sure. complicate the matter, but but just the uh, like it doesn't get you out of some of the the challenges of the intrinsic asynchrony. Uh, you still not going to get a good backtrace out of that stuff. It, you're not going to get a good backtrace. We got better on some of that stuff. Um, but yeah, no, it's still, I mean, there's a, look, there's a reason that we're, we're in rust because you, you are with, and I think that part of the ch- real challenge with Node is you are combining all of the laxity of JavaScript with this very kind of potent weapon in terms of, of an, of an act, actual asynchrony. And the results are kind of predictable. I mean, you're definitely dropping handguns off at the preschool and then, you know, coming back a couple hours later and it's a mess because, you know, the, the, uh, so yes, we, that did not work out well for us. Yeah. So the the other aspect of kind of asynchrony though, that was ultimately much more gutting though. And I, I, I don't know how, how this kind of relates. Cause I know that like, like, look, I know, Alex Wilson was threatening to Erlang bomb this Twitter space. And I know there are, in fact, there may be plenty of you like, and Erlang's a really, have you used Erlang at all, Adam? No, never. Uh, have you? Is that something you've, you've kind of used in anger? I would say it used me in anger. <laughs> um, the So we had, uh, I have not ever really cut Erlang for a living. But I was deploying a reasonably large Erlang system, RabbitMQ, and when that thing would misbehave, it would go into what we called the rabbit hole, and the rabbit hole was undi- undebuggable, undiagnosable. It was very hard to determine, and I think that one of the problems with the kind of the the Church of Erlang, if you will, is there was kind of this received smugness that the Erlang model and this kind of actor-based model that actually has a lot to be said for it yields a system that is so robust that we tautologically do not need to debug it. And that was my kind of experience there. I, I'm sorry to be so bitter about the airline experience. I may have had some production outages that were really, really, really painful. Yeah, I mean, I had similar problems with running RabbitMQ in production. Um, <laughs> it, it, uh, it was definitely challenging um, when we did run into problems to be able to work out exactly how to, like, pull ourselves out of them as well as just um feeling like we had competence and understanding of how the thing worked under the hood we just did not have that knowledge to be able to feel confident in like moving forward with a debugging process and being able to understand what was happening so that we could find our ways out of it the the sole fear for us was to move away from that as a technology well, yeah, and I don't know. And I, I, yeah, we can hear you. Yes, and I know you've okay. got some thoughts on on yeah. So hop in here. Yeah, I, I was just gonna I was just gonna mention this first of all. Yeah, I it is very important. Sorry, you just faded to nothing. Like we yeah, heard you. you did, the we heard you, and then it faded. <laughs> uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Better now. Okay. I was good. Okay. I think it's very unfortunate that a lot of people's first experience with Erlang is deploying RabbitMQ because that is <laughs> also my worst experience with Erlang, and I've had very good experiences with Erlang. Yeah, there you go. I totally okay. Yeah, absolutely. I, um, and I, for whatever it's worth, I do feel even at the time I'm like, I I know that this, and actually I don't think it's a rabbit issue. I think I had a Node AMQP issue. The problem is the system didn't help me debug it. So yeah, go on. How, how have you t- talk to us about how you actually implement large systems in Erlang? Honestly, I'm not the best expert to talk about for this, but what I can tell you is one of the things that um, one of the things you brought up earlier about like thousands to millions of threads, Erlang runs on a VM that is designed to be able to handle that kind of situation, um, and it is very pervasively it, it's, it calls it processes, not threads. It is very pervasive in all Erlang code that you write code as processes. Processes are isolated. You do very small things with it. You might write a process in Erlang where you would normally write a function in other languages. Right, and a process is strictly synchronous in Erlang, right? You, everything a process is going to do is going to be effectively synchronous with respect to itself. Is that correct? Essentially, yes. And then messages are... Oh, I hope I haven't written Erlang in a few... Well, it's right. been a few months, but... Yeah, yeah. Essentially, yes. And then, and then everything you do between different processes is all through message passing. There's no other way to uh, accomplish anything. 
Okay, so let me ask you this, because then you end up with these kind of millions of entities and totally agree that Beam supports this well. Do you Have you created a system that is almost biological in nature, though, in terms of its emergent behavior? Oh, and that is so easy to accidentally do, yes. Even in small projects. Yeah, interesting. Well, it's pretty cool, because I feel like as soon as your, you know, what is your reaction, the system's reaction to confined resources. And when that reaction is, I'm going to create more resources, it's like, I don't know what I'll do. I'm going to create you know, more processes, more tasks, more actors, more entities, more computational entities for this. Um, you're down the path to ruin, I think. I can't disagree with you there. <laughs> but, so that's it. But it, it, it isn't, I think that there's a lot to be said because then you know, the flip side of it is like really powerful things do fall out, right? Because like React, was a system that was able to be much more easily distributed because it was an airline. I think it's a fair statement. And I, we use Re React too, and React was no, nowhere near as dramatic as, as Rabbit. Um, also, I actually, the other thing, and I don't know, for those of you, Ian, it sounds like you deployed Rabbit. Um, and the, the thing I, let me just say as a quick aside, the other thing that would drive me, that drove me nuts about Rabbit is you would have a problem with Rabbit you can't figure out what's going on inside of Rabbit because there are only like three tools and you've already run them all. It's like, yes, I, ha I have no queue depth. I, I know that my queues are all like zero. That's not the issue. Like there's an issue internal to Rabbit and you're trying to Google the symptoms that you're seeing effectively. And the, uh, the meth the, all like the news groups that discuss Rabbit feature very prominently how reliable RabbitMQ is. So I mean, if you Google RabbitMQ, it's like, you know, RabbitMQ is messaging that just works. And it's like, you are not messaging that just works. That's why I'm here. If you were messaging that it just works, I wouldn't be Googling you right now. You don't, I don't know, Adam, have you ever had this happen? No, I, yeah, told, I mean, you're kind of getting gaslit by the, the, the I am lucky uh, Google search there. No, totally. And you're just like, I really need, if you, we could just be not quite so smug just a second because it's not working. And it's like, I've got a production outage right now that I'm trying to debug. Yeah, like let, let's get past the marketing material and into the debugging guide, such as it is. Yeah, and if, if you've oh. gotten, sorry, go ahead. Um, I sorry, I just remembered uh, earlier. I, I'm on debugging. Um, so the first uh, I said this on Twitter while I was having issues, but the first time I understand I understood async await was actually when I used the model that uh, the Zig programming language has. Um, so that's really interesting. Could you elaborate on that? I thought it was a very interesting comment, but I didn't. Yeah, yeah. So it doesn't do futures. It doesn't do promises. It doesn't do anything like that. When when you do an async call on a function, what you get back from that is a stack frame. You save that stack frame, and later when you want the value of whatever you had executed, you await that stack frame, and then that you that's what turns into the value. It, it's essentially the same idea as a future or promise, but it's explicit about what's under the hood. Okay, so um, that is really interesting because that is basically taking one layer of magic away that's saying yes. like look i'm going to make this marginally less magical for you but then uh, by putting you kind of explicitly in charge of it you're going to have a better idea kind of where these frames are and when they get re-executed and that is exactly that that is very much the zig philosophy everything zig does is kind of in that realm it gives you control it takes away a layer of magic so you can understand what is actually happening um, and then another thing about that is it, it's by default, when you run a program in Zig, when you're using async await, if you don't use the evented IO system, it's all single threaded. You, you can use async and await, but you you only have one thread of execution. When, uh, if, you, if you do something that's a blocking call, I believe under the hood, it will go and execute await uh, async things that you haven't awaited on yet. But normally what happens is just it whatever async call you do is suspended until you actually await on it again. So it's essentially lazy evaluation, or you can use that to basically also do coroutines, which yeah. under the hood, it also has suspend and resume, which are actually used to implement async await, which are essentially the same thing as coroutines would give you. Interesting. Of course, insert the path of ruin that Dan described earlier of not being able to reason about those things, especially in the kernel that actually block. But that's yeah, but here's the thing: because it's stack frames, and because of how Zig handles some of its debugging stuff, you like when you break on something and you look at a stack trace, you can't actually get much more of an idea. Or if it or if it breaks and dumps to the console, you actually still do get an idea of what's going on, even with the async and await and the coroutines in there. 
That's interesting. And is debuggability kind of one of their design centers for this? They do try to make things very debuggable, yes. I mean, the whole the whole idea is it's supposed to be a replacement for C that doesn't have C's pitfalls in a similar way Rust kind of replaces C++. So a lot of it is about making sure you don't do the wrong thing and you're able to debug when something does go wrong. Yeah, that is that is really interesting. Uh, hey, quick aside, has Twitter reduced the number of speakers we can have, Adam? Oh, really? Can we only can we only have a few now? What do we I don't know. So, Jimmy, I'm trying to approve you. Oh, yeah, it's... yeah, yeah. I, I was able to approve him. Okay, that's good. Right. Yeah, I don't know. It still says five spots open, but oh, right. now it's a, there was an error adding Jimmy. Let's oh, try again. Where what what secret console are you on? Are you like on the Twitter control plane? Where are you seeing this? Yeah, that's yeah. Good. You don't have the control. No, it's like just on. I the have to wonder if Twitter thing. thinks there's like five of me on or something. <laughs> no, no, no. I think we always people see one of you. I think it's just that I can't see you. All right. That... Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Jimmy. I don't uh, know if you're like Matt. You got your uh, from... you got your hand up. Oh, sorry, Adam. Oh, I was just saying, I don't, I don't yes. know, Jimmy, if you're so, calling in from your desktop or something, but I don't know, we're not unable to approve you. Sorry, go ahead, Matt. Yeah, so um, so getting back to the topic of uh, how how to introduce async to a yeah, to to a bright but inexperienced programmer like your son, and uh, at 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 the uh, at the risk of getting off onto a bit of a tangent about. Uh, my misadventures as a young programmer discovering async oh about 21 years ago um well first of all i wonder if it might help to start by in, in instead of instead of working at a high level of abstraction where where you look at tasks and and futures or promises maybe start with uh maybe start with a callback based approach like uh like old school node, so 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 he can understand a little more of what what's actually going on. And now, of course, if you want to really go down to a low level, you would write your own event loop using select or what have you. But um, so I, that is an interesting approach. That does require, though, that and I always felt that JavaScript is not really uh, taught very well because they don't get into closures early enough. That requires you to really teach about closures pretty early and about how state, like where is this variable state coming from and what does it mean when you modify this variable state? Well, when I, so um, when I first stumbled into uh, async um, in 2001, it was in, uh, it was in Python and uh, I briefly looked at the <laughs> what is this Twisted Python? Yes. yes. Oh God! I so I've never Adam. Have you ever used Twisted? No. I only know Twisted from the the, the wounded coming back from the front. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What, what is what is Twisted Python? Hey, go ahead, Matt. You want to explain what Twisted is? Sure. So so Twisted is this this whole um, async. Uh, framework for python and they've 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 got implementations of several protocols http of course um they they also have like a, a dns client and server and and implement you know, implementations and you know, varying levels of maturity of several other protocols but uh it's basically a you know <clears throat> an event loop uh framework for you know, yeah for for python for yeah, mainly for writing uh, network servers and clients, although they, they have integration with GUI toolkits as well. Um, Brian, I, you, you, you've got me curious now about uh, your uh, well, and, tales and, from the wounded. Well, and maybe I'm just like self-selecting for the wounded by getting involved in Node in 2010, but everybody coming to Node in 2009, 2010, especially 2010, was coming from Twisted and from Event Machine in Ruby and just having tried to build systems in Twisted that were that became the, like absolute monstrosities that they could not reason about. And with, with, with the emergent behavior in production that was just un, the, incomprehensible. Oh, uh, well, I could, I, could tell you, I could tell you a story about some of my own emergent behavior back in 2001. Um, and, and, uh, in particular, I was, I was just thinking about it. You, 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 you talked about, uh, accidental blocking earlier and, uh, I had to deal with, uh, an elusive production bug, uh, in, in my first twisted based server that, uh, was 
because it was it was uh, it was uh, spawning a process and communicating with it using pipes, and there was a bug in Twisted where I think they forgot to actually set one of the pipes into non-blocking mode, so it was hanging the one and only thread. <laughs> Whoops. Um, so, I, but but uh, I so uh, when yeah, you know, like I said, I started I started on this when I was uh, when I was about 20. So a few years older than, than Will and I had possibly been programming for much longer than he has so far at that point. But uh, I still writing servers was new to me. And I, I think my very first serious attempt at writing a server was uh, so back, back then I was, I was really into the, uh, the shout cast uh, uh, protocol for like internet, ra- yeah, internet radio stations, yeah, you know, like streaming audio, and it's it's basically well that there's two sides of it. There's the uh, there's the 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 trend, yeah, you know, the the sending side of it where where someone running Winamp with the Shoutcast plugin is sending uh sending an audio stream to the server, and that's that's basically just yeah. You know, send like a pseudo http uh no nah, no no it's it's a custom tcp protocol and i i don't want to get too off into the weeds here but you know send like metadata about your stream and then just start sending mp3 on and, and it, do i understand correctly then, that the shoutcast is that the shout in shoutcast is actually all caps uh, yes yes the and, shout uh, is actually shouted Yes, and 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 fun fact, um, the uh, the mixed case processing heuristic that some screen readers use uh, pronounces that as shoot cast because it's S H O U, and then it thinks that the second word is capital T cast. Right. So, yeah, uh, the, maybe not such the best decision to to make a yeah interesting. Well, it, it's a, so, but, but that's interesting in terms of like you are getting kind of started in programming, writing servers for stuff that you wanted to go do. do, do is this? Well, I mean, the, the official. I mean, Shoutcast, of course, had an official server, but the, there was this community-based internet radio station that I was involved with, and we 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 didn't like the buffering behavior of the official Shoutcast server. So I thought I'm going to write my own. And, and go ahead. Well, I was just going to ask is like, is, I mean, that is kind of interesting because I do feel that the, you, your introduction to async is when you have these extremely long latency events. And the longer latency the event and the more of them you want to do concurrently, I think the more likely you are to appreciate what asynchronous operations could do for you. So, Adam, I guess one question would be like, are, are there things that the youth do today? <laughs> like when the, when, the, when, the, when the youth are not actually getting buzz cuts from their friends that are not <laughs> halfway through, uh, I, I, how does the other half live? Adam? How, how does the how does the product how does the productive youth live? Uh, you know, he's mostly doing stuff with games, so I don't know that there is like a really strong motivating use case. And I, I, but I do think Matt, you're you're right that actually, I mean, I think even my own use of async, like the fact that I can use async productively all day you know, just empirically without being able to rattle off a useful definition, I think is, you know, is, is a testament to what you're describing. But it also just made me uncomfortable to think, you know, sure, I can show you how to do it. I, I can even show you why it's better than other situations. Um, and just disappointed that there's not, it's sort of not well documented and not well understood and, and maybe not even covered in systems textbooks. I, I think this is a place where the, the practice has, has outrun academia. So it, I want to see that coverage. I want to see if I can articulate why I thought that async was worthwhile for this project because I my my async implementation was actually my second iteration of that server. My first very naive implementation of a shoutcast compatible server was uh, multi-threaded. So like. A, a thread for the the source connection that's that's the the client that's sending the audio stream and then a thread per listener and the thread per listener was just kind of sitting there in a read call waiting for the listener to disconnect after 
after it had received the like pseudo HTTP request and sent the pseudo HTTP headers. But, and then the thread for the source would like, it would receive some data from the source. And then this is where the very naive part came in. It would go in and sequentially make blocking write calls to, uh, to all the listeners in sequence. Uh, I said sequentially, didn't I? To, uh, to send out the audio. And, uh, what we found when we were testing, when, when my, my friends and I were testing out this server was that like, if someone who had like a flaky dial up connection would, uh, would, because this was a thing in 2001, would, uh, would tune into the, uh, the audio stream, then they would kind of mess it up for everyone else because, you know, blocking right sys calls in sequence to, to send the working. audio out to all the listeners. So I thought, okay, I need to do something different here. And then combine that with the fact that uh, my second iteration of the server was going to be more complicated because in addition to just replicating what Shoutcast itself did, but with no upfront buffer because we wanted lower latency, um, uh, I also wanted to like send the stream off to an instance of the lame mp3 encoder that that's where our pipes to another process came in so so that uh, we could you know, re-encode it down to a lower bit rate for those pesky dial-up users um and so yeah. i thought and to okay. be clear you're using lame as a proper noun not an adjective there <laughs> right 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 yeah 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 the 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 most popular mp3 encoder then and right. now is called lame yeah, um, interesting. So, uh, so anyway, I, I thought, okay, I'm I'm gonna have some concurrency here, and and do I really want to try to get my head around yeah, threads and locks and condition variables and whatever synchronization primitives I had back then, and somehow fortuitously, and I I don't remember how I stumbled upon well first just the concept of async through the uh, the async core module in the python standard library and then and then i found twisted which was better because yeah, it would let me do things with with I, I think the big deal was was that i could set timers so i could set i, I could more easily do timeouts um but yeah, i thought like okay with if i if i have just one thread with mutable state and callbacks I thought that I could get my head around that more easily than you know, actual multiple threads. Yeah, that's interesting. That's a good way to think about it. Um, and and a, a very good kind of motivating example. Um, we do have a couple of hands that are up, so I want to get. And okay. The, the, the other thing I, I um, we we are, are going to need to we're going to want to end uh, closer to an hour. Um, for, so Adam can get to his uh, not the. <laughs> Not the, not the teenager who, I, I mean, there, there are certain things that all teenagers have in common. I don't think your, teen, your teenager, you could be on here all week. For, you know, all your teenager Absolutely. Dinner. But but you've got a five-year-old who's going to want dinner. There you we go. Got a, a kindergarten who's going to want dinner. So, uh, Ian, I want to get to you and then to Jimmy. Ian, go for it. Yeah, uh, just briefly on RabbitMQ, the main challenges that we had were around network petitions and general cluster interruptions. We luckily had a bit of a out there in that um, this was used to be able to feed messages from uh, the, the Trello monolith through to the WebSockets service. Um, so we could recover mostly by kicking everyone from WebSockets and forcing them to reconnect and catch up. Right, yeah. um, and the catch up mechanism was not using RabbitMQ uh, as a storage device. So <laughs> right, um, right. we, we uh, did have a way out, but it was not pleasant. Um, uh, in terms of Twisted, um, HipChat was written on, on Python. Oh, yeah, and, there you go. Uh, its successor was not. Uh, so that may give you some indication as to how <laughs> right. the experience went. Right, um, exactly. Instead, instead of using Node, though, they did move to Golang. Um, but again, I think that that was motivated by um, a desire to have a kind of a more baked more baked in uh, story as to how to handle um, concurrency. Um, totally. 
In terms of uh, answering Adam's original question, um, I think that the uh, HHVM slash hack um, uh, description of, of async operations is, is pretty solid in terms of the why um, and talking about hiding IO latency and, and data fetching latency. Um, I think this is a one of the big motivating factors for um, uh, for Facebook to fork away from PHP um, beyond the uh, the main performance, like straight line performance reasons. Um, this actually unlocks quite a few performance benefits for them. Um, yeah, but yeah, the overall, the, the the diagrams are good. The code example is not so good, <laughs> but the diagrams are good as well as just the high level explanation is still what you want there. In terms of why not for, for async or wait, um, yeah, I mean, the big challenge that we face as uh, as a large Node.js code base on Trello is um, kind of, uh, with async await is that event loop starvation problem where yeah. um, uh, we hit a certain number of outstanding async operations and each of them can only get a, a small slice of the event loop at a time and no one is making meaningful forward progress. And um, when programmers first encounter that in production, often the reaction is, oh, we'll increase our concurrency, and that does not help the situation. Right. Um, so th there's a need to be able to, uh, for programmers to understand that underlying event loop model and potentially dip into a CPU profile or something to be able to realize what's going on there. Yeah, interesting. And this is a great resource. I don't know, Adam, if you've seen the HHVM stuff. Yeah, actually, I was just taking a look at that. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's, that, that's a really, I, I really like the way they're, visual approach to explain what's going on. Yeah. And, you know, a uh, friend of the show, Keith Adams, um, had a big hand in HHVM. Yeah. Um, Back in the day. Although I, I, I'm not detecting Keith in this documentation, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, Jimmy. All right. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yep. yep. Excellent. I believe the reason why I couldn't join before, literally iOS 16 update. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I just rebooted it right after that, turned it off and on again, everything's fine. <sighs> but, uh, yeah, hearing um, how like the Zig concurrency story goes, I could just like hear the Vietnam helicopters like in the background being like, oh my gosh, no, like this is exactly kind of um, how I was dealing like a, a lot of systems similar like Python, like uh, post twisted era kind of works like async io is very much so like the same idea where you're kind of taking the current state or like even uh things like gunicorn which is like the python um like unicorn like ruby clone uh is basically like freeze the stack pause it like and then multiplex based on different like um io events and so all of this is like kind of similar hacks um so i just like got immediately triggered when i heard that um and was reminded even more so of what I think is the number one async hack I've seen in any programming language ever. Um, so I know that's like a lot of buildup, but um, it's, a, it's a thing called Trollius, which it came in Python ecosystem right Tro after- Trollius? Uh, like, yes, like a troll? Okay. Yeah, T-R-O-L-L-I-U-S, I, I think. I yeah, mean, this... I-U-S. Um, and so, so what it was is someone decided that they were like crazy enough to try to backport async IO to Python 27. Mm. Um, so, oh no, how do you do that? Um, and I, I actually built a production system on this for years. Uh, it was truly awful because it was easier than, uh, updating Python to Python three. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, so here we go. Someone realized that you could get multiplexing of like different coroutines by abusing the exception model in Python. Oh no, no, so no, <laughs> no! You would literally uh -oh. raise. You would yeah. raise when you wanted to pause, uh, pause the system, um, and like yield to another coroutine. Oh, um, God. And then th there was a core event loop that worked around catching exceptions and like like iterating to the next the next like state machine to run. And, um, and there should be something to describe this because there I'm sure to whomever this occurs to them it's like oh we can reuse this mechanism for this radically other different purpose and it's like you can but now it is 
that's going to give me nightmares <laughs> right exactly i know and it's it's it can feel elegant it kind of reminds me of like oh like i'm gonna have like threads by having like prostate shared memory it's like it might feel elegant but not having the purpose fit abstraction there and reusing this this other abstraction that doesn't really mean the same thing. It's not intended to be the same thing. It can be just absolutely brutal. Yeah, Jimmy, that must have been uh, the, the combat pay for sure. To, to be fair, um, it did make when... Well, so I actually stopped working on this project. This was actually Queda IO, which is the first private Docker registry. Um, the build hmm. system... Right. So I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that. Yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. So this was what was building everyone's containers. We had this Python um, like build okay. manager. And it talk about pronunciation. CD. You pronounce yeah. that Quay.io, not Key.io. It, it's it's, <laughs> it was, it's complicated. Because okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was always pronouncing that Key. The, I was pronouncing that Key.io. It's, it's Q-U-A-Y, which I would, I mean, you know, I would pronounce key, but I guess I guess it was all it, right. It is it is key. The founders are both American, so they uh, they say they, I, oh, I was like, you oh dear, oh god, you it key. It's the key to your containers at the first private registry. Like, come on, it's that's a good pun. Like, <laughs> but <laughs> no, uh, but yeah. So, so it had a build manager, which is orchestrating building Docker files for people, and uh, that build manager was kind of like a distributed process. Um, it ran on every single node that was running Quay. And it basically talked to etcd to maintain state and like format jobs like to Kubernetes that then built people's uh, uh, built their containers in a VM. So like there's a lot of this async state happening in each of them. Was this uh, a pleasant all... system to be in? This sounds like I, I... this was an awful system. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I mean I am gonna I'm gonna wake up in like a cold sweat. This system sounds it sounds like um, <clears throat> that would be a system that would need some production level feeding. That would be really frustrating. You would get a stack trace, and there was no debugging the stack trace. Like you, you because you you would get a stack trace that was the state of the event loop of like the previous three coroutines. It was like the current coroutine and like the four behind it. Like <laughs> there is nothing for you to look at. You're just like, is um, this your card? No, that's not my card. No, it's, it's not, not my card. Helpful. How about these other three cards? I'm like, I don't even know who these those people are. One of those is attached to a severed finger, by the way, and I've got no idea who any of those people are. So yeah, that's uh, yeah. Oh man, that sounds um, brutal. Uh, but it did make eventually basically migrating it to to Python three quite quite simple. Um, well, so I, I do think there is an important point here in that the that the abstractions have improved over time like we are getting better at these at these abstractions and one would not i would love to believe build that system de novo today today there are better things whether it's rust or zig or even go there are better things to pick from today um i, I have like to say there is like one thing that kind of frustrates me about all of these systems like you were saying earlier and i don't know if you talked about this because i tuned in late but it, it basically just that like Every, once you start hitting, like, you start hitting basically the runtime's queuing throughput, like, everything mm -hmm. starts to fall apart. Mm -hmm. Why the hell has no one given us a handle just to nice things? Like, we have nice... <laughs> okay, because... Like, because like, okay, th that's a great question. That's a great question. And it's because you are... So, actually, Adam, I'd like to say if you need to go address... So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 yeah, that's fine. You can be around, and I, I will be. I, Adam has warned me that I'll be. I, I'll be solo when we hit the top of the hour, which is fine. Um, the because I want to get the other hands that are up, but I think that this is a real, this is a great question, and it's because it's the, uh, asynchronous systems are to a certain degree they're telling a bit of a fib with respect to what the system can actually do, and once you are exhausted the fib and you are hitting queuing delay. I don't know, really know what the system can do because it's like you, yeah, like you overbooked the flight, you know? It's like, yeah, like some of these people can't travel to Denver today um, because they, we don't actually, and th th the result is going to be, I mean, to me, it's like that is endemic. And the question is more, can you please help me debug all this stuff and don't let these cues be hidden. I mean, one of the problems that we had and the uh, um, with, with Postgres replication, true asynchronous nightmare where the, the you've got walls being the right ahead log being shipped effectively asynchronously and then applied synchronously. 
And that async, it, once that backs up, you've got no visibility into it, first of all. When that backs up into the primary, it is really hard to figure out what the hell's going on and why. Um, and it's, it's a, now you've got a multi-system asynchronous system that's just misbehaving. Uh, I want to get to um, Rob, I want to get to you, and then to, to Brantley. Um, so uh, I, I love Kelsey Heistower's uh, Unmute Yourself and Introduce Yourself. But uh, Rob, you there? Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Awesome. Uh, yeah, I uh, I sort of just could, through my own experience, could speak a little bit to like what async kind of is or what we use for, um, which is a question that I don't think has a clear answer. It's, um, so I at this university first with Ned, I got right into to, uh, chat, so like telnetting and talking to people and these, you know, muds or similar things. And I became like, I utterly just through this, like this, how does this work? And so um, a copy of Unix Network Programming, um, the Stevens book, which was like a s significant outlay for me at the time as a, as a core <laughs> student. But right. um, you know, I saved I up for that session. Oh, it's, it's, it's still on my shelf. I, I refer to it uh, at least once a month. Um, for some detail of TCP, but, uh, um, you know, I started writing the very basic, uh, like, start with the echo server and, and these sort of things, and there is a section in there about, well, here is, you know, so you have found that if you want to read from two sockets at the same time, one of them will block, and here is a bunch of strategies for working around it, and, it, you know, this is old enough that it's really it's talking about select, and this was just after, like, POSIX threads had appeared, so it talked a little bit about that, and so I spent a lot of time learning these things. Um, and, but it was always, the question it was always trying to answer was, how do I not block? And that was, that was the only thing. I didn't have parallel computation to do. I didn't have, you know, this is just chat. This is like, you are paused most of the time. This is just making sure you don't block. And from there, I, you know, went on to learn about, um, like, uh, Dan Kegel, the, the C10K problem and learned lots about that. You know, how do we make systems deal with thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of connections? Then my career has mostly been as a sysadmin adjacent to that. So now, you know, you're running your Nginx, which is, um, you know, here are 100,000 connections that I'm proxying through to someone, somewhere else. The entire purpose of this thing is to accept the connection, create a backend connection, and then get out of the way and let the kernel proxy that. Yeah. Um, so... Yeah, I mean, these are all good things. And Brian, I know you've had some experience with EPOL. We don't need to talk about it specifically, but the... Uh, <laughs> the I mean, but that's the EPOL implementation. I mean, the, I, I actually, like, I, I, the model is, is very useful. I think EPOL or event ports or IO complete ports, what have you. They're very useful model. Oh, it absolutely is. And I mean, this... I know that Twitter space is just translated EPOL as Ebola. Just <laughs> <laughs> you know... I, you know, Twitter spaces, maybe I've misjudged you. I, I... <laughs> it's very good. Uh, so, so I guess, quite, and now, you know, I'm, I'm still running those kind of systems. And, but for me, um, yeah, the, the story of like async interfaces to the kernel, at least, has been about getting my user space program out of the kernel's way. And I mean, on Linux recently, I don't claim it's the first time, it's just what I'm familiar with. There's recently been work on a thing called uh, IOU ring, which is yes. base, basically an alternate syscall layer that uh, has a shared, uh, a, some memory shared between the kernel and user space that lets you submit requests directly into this memory pool and get your get the results of those back out. So it's an alternate syscall interface and it kind of splits the syscall in half. So it's very, it's kind of future looking if you squint a little bit, but um, but just that idea of just getting into the kernel as fast as I can. So that's been like most of my career. Yeah. When, when futures and promises became a, a sort of a, you know, a big idea in languages, um, the developers I work with, you know, started looking at that and introducing it. And I did not get it. And I did not, and, and like, I got there eventually, but it didn't fit onto any model I had. And I'm still, you know, this year only coming to realize that it's because in some ways we're kind of talking about different things a little bit, like what, what we, why we actually want to do 
async, why we, what concurrency means, what we're trying to do. They're trying to do work and what's the next thing and what's the next thing and what's the next thing and kind of complete this multi-sequence task uh, uh, you know, as as we're ready to do the next piece, whereas I'm just like, except connection, get the hell out of the way. And it's been, yeah. the, I'm, I'm not making a point. I'm just speaking to that idea that there are kind of different views into into this and maybe there's something about how we teach it that in that. Yeah, you tell me. The, <laughs> the, the interesting, appreciate the contribution. Um, so I, uh, Brantley, you're gonna you're gonna take us home here. <laughs> cool. I just wanted to uh, say a little bit about the history of Python and yeah, think, um, which is you know back in two point whatever I don't know. Um, they the people from Eve Online came together and, and made Stackless Python, which I don't know if anybody remembers, but it was basically like taking the stack out of C and. They were able to do a lot of concurrency based on that in the green thread. It's basically coroutines, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, and then some really smart people figured out, well, we can just do that in Python, and they made Eventlet, uh, and then G-Event huh. came out of that. Um, and I was using, I mean, G-Event, I think, or I mean, Eventlet was just amazing. You could do these async operations without having to deal with you know, all of this threading stuff. And, and so from my perspective, uh, it has always been, async has always been sort of counter to threading. These threads, you know, just steal, you know, you're going along and then it just steals the, the pointer away from you and it's doing something else and you have to lock and do all these things. So from my perspective, a really good way to teach it is maybe teaching threading and then teaching uh, async as as cooperative threading, right? The idea that I'm I'm giving up uh, execution when I'm done, and then, oh, or when I'm waiting on an IO, I'm giving up execution. Yeah, uh, and then you can come in. Yeah, I, just, no, I think it's a good point, and I, I I also think it's interesting that it was invented by Eve Online, which I swear I, I yeah. am not. I'm not. I only hear about Eve Online when there's this like apocalyptic event happening in what feels like this parallel universe. <laughs> it's very, yeah, right. exactly. and there's like some grand act of like intergalactic warfare happening, and I'm like, wow, this is a very ornate well, world. Yeah, so and imagine what's happening in their servers at the same time. And they're right, totally. No, that's it. It's like, yeah, that's like I can see why you have to invent new kind of concurrency mechanisms. Um, well, what you might not know about Twisted is uh, Twisted originally came out of a uh, multiplayer game project uh, that the, the the original author of Twisted was working on a game called Twisted Reality, and. Hmm. And uh, I, I don't know whatever became of that, but uh, that that the the, the framework uh, came out of that project. And I I gotta see if I can dig up his his earliest writings about uh, async versus threads because I yeah, I mean good. he he I I I remember reading a, a, what a fairly convincing explanation of you know, of why he thought async was better. And I, and of course, because, because we had to make a religion out of it, I was a convert. Right. Exactly. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. See if you dig that up. Um, meanwhile, so we're, uh, unfortunately, uh, we're, we're kind of out of time here. I've got, I'm going to have to, I've got to split myself here. I know Adam's already taken off. Um, well, Brian, do we want to tease yeah. losing the signal? I definitely want to tease losing the signal. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for, for uh, reemerging long enough to the, so, uh, we are really excited. Uh, we talked about losing the signal uh, last week. This is this terrific book um, th by uh, Jackie McNish and and Sean Silkoff on the rise and fall of RIM. It is mesmerizing. It is very well written. It's very well researched. Um, and I'm uh, very happy to announce that Sean is going to join us in two weeks. So no Twitter space next week. Um, I'm going to be traveling to the Open Source Firmware Conference. Um, but in two weeks, uh, Sean is going to join us and we're going to talk losing the signal. And Adam, you and I had a preview of that conversation today. And I think that's, that's going to be a banger. Oh, going to be awesome. And, uh, so, so give it a read if, if you want to participate and soon to be the basis of a major motion picture. <laughs> major motion picture. Exactly. So, 
Lots of, <laughs> lots of reasons to check it out. Yeah, it's good. And an uh, outstanding book, really. I think actually that particular rise and fall has got a lot to teach us. So really interesting stuff. That's going to be in two weeks. Uh, and we'll look for Adam. This is a great topic. Obviously, a lot to be said. I feel like you and I rightfully predicted that this one could go on for days and days <laughs> and nights. Absolutely. I, I think there's, that there's a lot that to be said about this. So thank you, everyone, for participating. Uh, and we'll talk to you in two weeks. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. See ya.